Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Powerful People interview series. Um, and as you've noticed, we've been doing this every week during Parkinson's Awareness Month. And um, I'm Nina Mosier. I'm Hi, the everybody. executive. Welcome to our Powerful Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm the executive director and co-founder of Power for Parkinson's. And um, I am really excited about our speaker today. I, I think we're going to have, um, this will be something really unique uh, for all of you. Um, and hopefully you'll learn a lot today. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Ted Thompson, who um, is the Senior Vice President of Public Policy for the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. He's had 25 years of experience in public policy and government affairs, serving in several nonprofit uh, leadership positions and as a staff to two members of Congress. Prior to joining the foundation, uh, Ted served as president and CEO of the Parkinson's Action Network which is a Washington DC based nonprofit focused on federal policy issues affecting people with Parkinson's disease. And before that, he was the vice president of federal government relations at the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. And there he directed overall federal strategy for the national organization, as well as coordinated strategic lobbying efforts. Um, he was also the Senior Vice President of Public Policy and Mission Advancement for the National MS Society, Minnesota Chapter, the President of the National Association to Prevent Sexual Abuse of Children, and the Legislative Council Director of Federal Re Relations at the Minnesota Medical Association. He also has independently consulted for several nonprofits, for-profit companies, and political entities. Ted has been instrumental in moving public policy forward in the Parkinson's arena. And I think that you're gonna find his work fascinating and empowering. So Ted, would you like to join us? Thank you, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. And I appreciate the, uh, the intro. Yeah, sure. Well, so great to have you here. Uh, we're gonna just get our view squared away. There we go. All right, well, thanks um, for joining us today. And um, I just wanna let our audience know that we have the chat open and you can send in any questions as we go along and we'll try to answer those uh, for you. So I thought uh, today, Ted, we could just start out um, talking about the Unified Parkinson's Advocacy Council, which is how I sort of am connected uh, to you and just why it's important for the Parkinson's community to speak as a unified voice. A great way to start it out. Um, one of the things I point out to people is I may work for the Michael J. Fox Foundation, but my work is focused on the issues important to the broader Parkinson's community. Um, and in order to do that, uh, especially when you're talking about uh, policy, uh, doing it alone is very difficult, but doing it in coalition is where we can make some headway. And it's critical that we engage the Unified Parkinson's Advocacy Council members, because you all are on the ground in the community. Some are national organizations, some are regional, um, but you all are going to know better what types of issues impact the patient and the caregiver um, and the health provider community you know, throughout the country. And uh, it, it enables us to also, uh, instead of speaking with multiple voices or on, on multiple issues, it's a way that we've been able to bring the broader Parkinson's community together um, to make sure that we're in sync, that we're using the same statistics, we're using or pushing the same legislation, uh, things of that nature. So uh, for me, the UPAC is a, a really essential uh, partner for us to move public policy forward. And while I'm not going to get into a lot of examples, I will give one very um, uh, tangible example of where UPAC has been able to have impact. Uh, it's not unusual for drugs or um, a diagnostic like that scan to get removed from a drug formulary or to get removed from being covered by a health insurance plan. And on a number of occasions, those have uh, been brought to us. And then we've responded with a letter from the UPAC 
to the authorities within the health plan. And I think every time we've been able to get those health plans to put those drugs back on the formulary or to cover the diagnostic DAT scan. So that's a tangible aspect of how we've been able to use the partnerships and the UPAC um, to, to uh, enhance um, the voice of the Parkinson's community. Yeah, well, I think that's, it's so critical. And I know there's so many um, different organizations and that you're able to just bring you know, those important issues to light is, makes such a difference. Um, so I guess just to put things in perspective, can you um, elaborate on the financial burden of Parkinson's and then why it's so important to invest in research for a cure? Because I know that's Absolutely. a big focus. Absolutely. When I, when I joined the foundation um, almost six years ago, one of the th- points that I made internally was, um, you know, we've got the stories, we've, we've got a very activated community, but we need more facts and we need more data. And so we commissioned this very comprehensive multi-year, ended up being multi-year, uh, economic burden re- report. Um, and it gave us the most comprehensive data um, ever in terms of the cost of Parkinson's, not just for the patient, um, but for caregivers uh, through lost wages uh, to the federal government, et cetera. And based on the 2017 data, the, the burden was about $52 billion. Mm-hmm. And almost half of that is paid for by the federal government because almost 90% of Parkinson's patients are on Medicare. And so that's been a major talking point for us the last few years is to highlight to the federal government, you know, you're spending t- at least $26 billion a year to care for people with Parkinson's yet you're only investing about $240 million uh, toward research into the disease. And so, uh, you know, the, the part of, so the cost of the disease is a tool for us to try and get policymakers and regulators to focus more on the research um, aspect of Parkinson's, because, you know, if we, we haven't done this, but I'm sure we could quantify if we could slow the disease onset, if we could slow the progression of the disease. Obviously, if we could cure the disease, all those costs of the federal government go away. Um, but so that that is part of the argument that we have to make as we talk to congressmen and senators is that, you know, by investing in Parkinson's research, you're actually looking to save the government money. Yeah, well, that's it's uh, pretty um compelling when you're going to talk about those kind of numbers. And uh, I know that we all feel it. Um, So in the data collection, I know, you know, you're still working on collecting data um, because I feel like a lot of the big, you know, the data is lacking in some areas. And so I know you've spent time trying to institute data collection at the state level um, to provide information to researchers, to the CDC and different policymakers. Um, what is the current state of the data collection and why is this sure. so critical? Yeah, absolutely. The, um, well, the oldest Parkinson's disease registry in the country is in Nebraska, um, and it actually kind of predated electronic medical records. So we're uh, working right now around how do we, how do we modernize that registry? Uh, The biggest one, of course, is in California. Um, They kicked off their Parkinson's registry uh, about three years ago. um, And at the beginning of the pandemic, when it looked like states were going to, you know, have empty uh, uh, tills, we actually provided some funding to California to keep that registry going. Um, But uh, more recently, with the Parkinson's registry in California, we actually pushed to broaden it to be neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, because we'd already proven they could do data collection on Parkinson's. And so it's actually not that difficult to open it up to other diseases. And that was important to us uh, for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is oftentimes these the disease these diseases have common attributes or um, research into a disease like MS or Alzheimer's could produce a breakthrough for Parkinson's and vice versa. And so ultimately, I think that the entire neurological community would like to see this kind of data collection effort. Uh, Parkinson's is just kind of leading the way. Um, But we also have, there's a voluntary registry in Washington state, Um, West Virginia, just last Monday, the governor signed a bill to establish on Parkinson's awareness day, signed a bill to establish a Parkinson's registry in West Virginia. 
Uh, and that state has the third highest prevalence of Parkinson's case, cases in the country. Um, we are working now, uh, both Massachusetts and Maryland have enacted legislation to create advisory councils to develop a registry um, uh, plan. Uh, and then we've introduced, uh, we've gotten bills introduced in a number of other states, uh, including Hawaii and Michigan. Uh, the last, the, the next one though that we think will happen is in the state of Ohio. Um, and I will mention um, in this, and I'm, I'm going to make the point about the folks watching this um, interview, how, what kind of role you could actually play. Because the Ohio legislation, it wasn't because we, you know, in our DC office conjured up this idea that, hey, let's go to Ohio. It was actually an advocate in Ohio that knows his state senator and the senator knows of his Parkinson's. And so when the senator's uncle was diagnosed, he went to this advocate and said, what can I do? That was a conversation that started the legislation, the legislative effort in Ohio. Um, and, uh, and in West Virginia, we've got a longtime advocate in West Virginia uh, who's wanted to push a registry bill for a number of years. And since I finally hired a state government relations person, it was kind of teed up and uh, lightning speed and don't, I'm not saying this to let people think we can replicate it, but in 30 days, a bill was introduced. It passed the House, it passed the Senate, it went to the governor, um, which is just remarkable speed. Um, by comparison, at the federal level, we did succeed in getting a, a data collection effort at the CDC. That took 10 or 11 years to get authorized and then another two years to get the money for it. Um, and so it just shows you that at the state level, things can happen a lot faster. Um, and let me state what is important about all of this is it's not just creating registries for the sake of data collection. Uh, why it's so important is you get population-based data collection on all the people in a given state that have the disease. That is the type of database that researchers don't currently have. And that could really, uh, you know, create a, maybe a, almost a paradigm shift in some of the research efforts because with a population-based database, researchers are going to be able to explore avenues that they may not have been able to explore before and things like finding hotspots of Parkinson's, you know, is a hotspot because of heavy trichloroethylene use or heavy paraquat or other pesticide use. Uh, so those are some of the types of benefits of these registries is that researchers are just gonna have access to data that they've never been able to have access to before. I, um have a question about the registry. So once that's instituted, who is submit? So the physicians are submitting information. To gov How does that yeah. happen? How's yeah, the way it works, and there, there are a couple of different ways that it can happen. In West Virginia, it's actually going to be um, spearheaded by West Virginia University. Um, in the states I mentioned, it's at the Department of Public Health. But essentially, uh, an advisory committee agrees on what data should be collected. The department um, then puts together a, a plan for how to do that data collection. They notify providers, healthcare providers, doctors, uh, and others that they are now required to report a Parkinson's diagnosis into the state. Now, key for everybody to understand is the data is confidential. You know, people's mm -hmm. names and addresses. Are, you know, the so so it is a mandatory reporting. Um, so that we capture all the people that have the disease, but it's, um, you know, it's controlled by state and federal privacy laws. Now the research component, which may make people wonder, well, how can researchers access the data if they can't access the people? Well, there are mechanisms by which um, a research researcher can submit proposals to do research based on the data. And if it's just kind of population-based, uh, broad-based data, um, that is identified that they need, then, you know, they can get the data. But in some cases, they're going to want to do a clinical trial or do something more specific. And through the third party of the state, um, the researchers can reach out to see if people would want to voluntarily uh, participate. So there is a mechanism to actually get um, individual participation in clinical trials, but it's on the person with Parkinson's, it's their decision whether they want to participate. Um, so none of their personal information is released um, to researchers or the government or anybody else. Right. I mean, it's released to the government as part of the data collection. Yes. Yeah. The identified. Yeah. Yeah. 
So with all this data collection, is there any work being done to um, diversify the research though and be more inclusive of people of color and women of different ethnicities? Because I know that's been, uh, I, I've seen that kind of lacking in the past. Absolutely, that's been a major priority for the foundation for a number of years. Um, we've got um, an initiative called Fire Up, which is uh, sites at several places around the country focus on diversifying clinical trials. We also have something called Black PD, B L A A C PD, um, which is a global effort to diversify clinical trials. And we've got um, sites around the world. Uh, people can learn more about those on our website. So we've got those initiatives that are the Fox Foundation initiatives. Um, but yeah, absolutely, as part of the data collection effort, uh, we're focused on diversification. We have a separate uh, uh, initiative with the VA to try and bring in more, uh, uh, more diverse veterans into the research um, uh, realm. And we're actually funding some VA efforts to make that happen. So we, we're trying to take a holistic approach. You know, from a policy standpoint, of course, we're supporting legislative and regulatory efforts toward uh, greater diversification. But, um, you know, we, we believe that all the estimates of the numbers of people with Parkinson's, even our own, you know, they're, they're not accurate because they're based on subsets or samplings and things like that. But we really believe that the percentages of, of Black, Hispanic, Asian, uh, and other non-white groups that have PD are woefully inadequate and, and way too low. So these are, they're big challenges though, um, because one of the reasons uh, certain communities, mis underrepresented communities, um, aren't counted is they may not have been diagnosed. They may not have access to specialists. Um, and that's where uh, another policy issue, telemedicine, telehealth is really an important tool to try and reach the broadest possible segment of the population. Yeah, well, that actually was a question I was going to ask you about is the telehealth um, initiative. And uh, I know telehealth has become such a big thing during the pandemic, but um, I know you're working on having that continue. So what, um, maybe you could just talk about, you know, why that is so important and why. Sure, know, sure. Why. Yeah, the, the pandemic cr uh, created um, through the public health emergency of the federal government, greater flexibilities for telehealth, including reimbursement, which is oftentimes the big hang up. Um, and what we have found is, well, early in the pandemic, telehealth usage skyrocketed, of course, but for Parkinson's specifically, um, it has really enabled a lot of patients who never were able to access a movement disorder specialist to finally see a movement disorder specialist. And first we were hearing about this anecdotally about how their care plan was improved, the medications were corrected, um, but we actually have a, a doctor here in Northern Virginia um, that his paper isn't published yet, um, but his data is pretty overwhelming in terms of the number of new patients that his team could see through, te through telehealth and that it was like 85% of those new patients had never seen a movement disorder specialist before. And that just, uh, it, it really amplifies the disparity of care in this country because you know, your general practitioner or your general neurologist just isn't going to be able to provide the kind of uh, detailed care and care plan as a movement disorder specialist neurologist. So, you know, uh, so those are some of the reasons it's so important. But another reason, um, I was asked once on, on a call like this, well, but you've got a, it's a movement disorder. How can a televisit be beneficial? Yeah. I said, well, it's actually got a different benefit, which is the doctors can be in the home and the doctors can get a visual of how the home is set up. And, you know, if there's a care partner that can walk through the house and show different. So a doctor is able to advise on, on how to better, you know, lay out a home. You should have grab bars here. So there are, are different benefits to telemedicine uh, beyond just the access to, to better care. Yeah. Well, I do think I agree with you. I mean, I think it's so it could be so important and that there's so few. I mean, even well, for us here in Austin. Texas. I mean, we're limited uh, by the number of specialists we have here, and it right. could take months to get in. And uh, but I feel like that's it's critical that someone with Parkinson's sees 
movement disorder specialist. So yeah, because we can't we can't solve that shortage issue. I mean, we've got a, a movement disorder fellowship program at the at the foundation, and I know Georgetown has one. And you know, there are several efforts to try and increase the number of movement disorder specialists. But in some respects, that's just you know throwing a few drops in a big pond, and it's not enough. And that's where telehealth can really uh, provide that access. Because there are some states that go between having zero and one movement disorder specialists okay. in the entire state. And, um, you know, and the other factors too, it's the convenience. It's the, you know, people's stress levels go up. If they have to go get in a car, drive an hour and a half to go see the doctor and all the delays and, you know, just there's so many benefits to tele, uh, telehealth. So um, so where, what is the status on that initiative right now? The Biden administration just extended the public health emergency for another 90 days. Um, so it'll go into, I think it's like July 11th. Um, the Department of Health and Her Human Services has said that when they do plan to end the public health emergency, they will give a 60 day notice. And so every 30 days, we're looking to see if the 60 day notice comes out. Um, but one of the provisions um, uh, that, that is out there now too, though, is that the telehealth flexibilities are going to last for like for another, I don't know why they picked this number, 151 days <laughs> beyond the expert, expiration of the emergency. And so that essentially, you know, buys the time um, to get Congress to do what they need to do to make it permanent. Um, you know, we've been focused on trying to create telehealth as a benefit for many years, um, but this provides a pretty unique opportunity to try and make that happen. So we work in coalition with many other, you know, patient and provider groups uh, trying to get it made permanent. Um, and then there's the, you know, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services said, we can't make it permanent. You know, Congress says, yes, you can. And so there's a bit of a you know, disconnect between the, the agency and the legislative branch. So. Um, so that's part of what we're working on is getting them, you know, to figure it out, because if we just yeah. let it go, it, it could create major disruptions for the patients. Yeah, well, I hope it gets passed. I think it will be very beneficial <laughs> to a lot of a lot of people. Um, let's see, we got a couple questions while we were talking. Um, I thought there, since uh, this one is uh, relevant to our conversation, and Steve asked if um, since Texas, which I don't believe Texas has a registry, what can we do to get one? Well, um, you're correct. Texas does not have a registry. Um, Julia uh, Worcester from my team is the director of state government relations. And um, she would be the one you would want to contact. And the easiest way to get to her is um, by emailing our policy inbox. And we're going to Put that in the chat, but it's policy at michaeljfox.org. Um, so yeah, Texas would be, I mean, we've talked about Texas. It would be a great state because of its size, its diversity, uh, et cetera. So um, yeah, we would definitely like to explore Texas as an option. Okay. Steve, you have some work to do. <laughs> well, we've got, we've got several uh, very I'm good sure people. there are a lot of people that are, would be very interested in that. And we've got yeah several UPAC partners you know in in Texas you know in Dallas and Houston and, and with you so um, yeah definitely want to want to look at Texas yeah yeah um, I'm trying to read this other question I'm not exactly sure I understand that question so. yeah so Ben Bennett is asking. How can we make it a requirement to add more local resources to after visit summaries and reach the newly diagnosed? So how can we make it so that our um, health providers are sharing resources with us that are local and up to date and can assist us? Which I think most do. It, it's a good question though, because we've heard um, through some of our UPAC partners that, uh, about that being more of a problem. That's more of a local and state issue. Um, but uh, from a self-advocacy standpoint, you know, you could be talking to the provider groups um, and the health plans in your state, highlighting why that is so important. 
Um, now that might seem like a pretty onerous thing to just take on yourself, um, but that's where I think you know the UPAC uh, membership could be looking into that and how best to to do that, um, because it, it is true that not all healthcare providers. Um, uh, not all healthcare providers probably know enough about the disease um, uh, to provide the kind of resources that you're uh, you're talking about. I will note that the Parkinson's Foundation conducted a study, uh, and and it hasn't been published yet. And we we uh, participated in it, or were we were part of the study. But um, in terms of where Parkinson's patients get the most in the, most of their information. We all do, we all like to think it's from groups like ours, and we do provide a ton of information, all of us. But they primarily rely on their doctor or their care provider for the information, which highlights to me that we do have a great opportunity um, to reach out to those communities um, along the way uh, that the questioner has asked the question. Um, because if the doctors and nurses are the ones that the patients rely on most for the information, yeah. we need to make sure that they have the best information that's out there so they can convey that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I mean, I know that we find that as a challenge because we have to reach the providers and they're not always up on all the different resources. And there's Michael J. Fox and the Parkinson's Foundation and many other organizations that offer um, you know, everyone does something that's a little bit different. So it's, um, it is challenging. So I think getting in on that ground level is really important. Right, right. But, but hard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, well, let's see. We were also, this is another question. I know this is something that was come, that you've worked on a lot. Um, in your recent update you sent to the UPAC um, group, you were highlighting how uh, that Congress passed uh, the fiscal year 2022 budget, which included a brand new pool of $90 million in new Defense Department research funding. Can you talk about the, well, why it's the Defense Department would be funding the research and then what um, that research, uh, how it's related to Parkinson's, and what we can expect from that. Right, right. Well, historically, um, Parkinson's has had its own research fund at the Department of Defense um, focus on neurotoxins, and that's been around since the late 1990s. Um, but this year, uh, as part of the defense spending bill, they created two new pots of money. One is 30 million, one is 60 million. Um, and one is focused on uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, uh, and I think the other one, again, is more around uh, toxins and that. Uh, but, but in the language creating these research funds, Parkinson's was a specific disease called out. So while, while this 90 million isn't dedicated only to Parkinson's, the fact that Parkinson's was one of only a couple of diseases called out uh, uh, creates a great new opportunity for the research community. Now, in terms of specifically what they're going to do and how to access the funding, we still don't know that um, because this bill got signed not that long ago and the Defense Department hasn't um, you know, put pen to paper on how this is going to work. But we have, even before this, you know, we're, we're connected with several uh, research leaders within the Department of Defense. Uh, in terms of why it's at the Department of Defense, which is a good question and a question several lawmakers ask. Uh, these research funds originally were for diseases related to military service. Um, some of the funds have been expanded that don't really have a military connection. Parkinson's actually does because of Agent Orange. And now more recently, you know, the Middle East wars, uh, exposure to burn pits, uh, there's connection to, to Parkinson's. Uh, but, but the why at the Department of Defense, it's in part because, you know, they, they've got a responsibility for these soldiers and sailors, and the more they can do to try and prevent diseases, you know, the, the better it is for the military and ultimately for the VA and the federal government. And so, you know, I think there's, I'm not going to say moral obligation, but, but they feel an obligation that they do need to be doing some of their own independent research. 
the other thing I will say is that the Defense Department tends to, to do research differently. They're more um, uh, high risk, high reward. Uh, it's, it's research that the National Institutes of Health typically wouldn't do. NIH is focused more on basic research, whereas DOD, DOD is focused more on let's get answers and let's solve problems. Okay, well, that's, that's good to know. And I'll be curious to see where, where they end up and what's, what comes yep. out of that. Uh, which, um, so, which I guess leads us to the next sort of topic that you um, have worked on is working with veterans with Parkinson's and that they're, um, I saw your statistic that you posted, there's 110,000 veterans in the United States. Uh, with Parkinson's, and I know you've worked really hard to support them. Can you talk, um, talk about the legislation that might possibly help that group? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, the, um, of the roughly million Americans with Parkinson's, 10 to 12% of them serve in the military. That's a really high percentage of people in a specific um, group. Yeah. And uh, for a long time, there has been a um, Parkinson's program within the VA, but what it has never had is the funding to fulfill its mission. Its funding has almost, it, well, it certainly hasn't kept up, kept up with inflation, but over 20 years, uh, it's only increased by about a million dollars for this uh, program to provide care uh, and clinical services for pay, uh, veterans around the country. So this legislation we are working on first, uh, is attempting to right size the budget. We're calling for a doubling of the budget and not just a doubling for doubling sake. We have justification as to why that doubling needs to happen. Because right now the VA, it's, you know, the folks working for Parkinson's veterans, they're like MacGyver, you know, with two pit, toothpicks and, and paper clips, just keeping things going. Right. And we want to give them the funding that they can actually pay for the individuals that they need to provide the care. Um, and then I'm, I think there are seven of these sites around the country, but they have a hub and spoke model with these consortia sites. I think there are about 50 of those around the country, but the consortia sites have always been doing this for free. I mean, they've never gotten any federal funding. Um, and so it is just woefully inadequate in terms of the, the funding for uh, this program, the Padrex. So that's a key, a key piece is to get them funded at the proper level. And then um, adding two more sites, um, Florida probably, because they have more veterans with PD than any other state. And then there's a major gap in middle America. There's nothing in the Midwest. And so if you're you know, from Minnesota, you have to fly to San Francisco if you actually want to go to a pod rec. Well, that's not very convenient. So yeah. we want to expand, expand the number of pod recs. Um, and then the final point I'll make is, Again, um, and, and we talked to lawmakers about this. After 20 years of war, you know, there's a surge of veterans, and there are probably is going to be a surge of veterans with Parkinson's because of these exposures. And so let's, you know, prepare for that now, and let's get the Podrex and the VA system ready for that influx of additional Parkinson's patients. Well, that sounds. It's a lot of work, but really so important because I know we have lots of veterans involved in our program, exercising with us and involved in different ways. So yeah, no, it's important. And we put a um, we we had put a working group together uh, that included veterans um, leading up to this proposal, um, and and certain veterans organizations like the Vietnam Veterans of America, because um, obviously Agent Orange um, in Vietnam. There's a significant number of veterans that are uh, have PD because of that exposure. So, um, yeah, we're trying to take a comprehensive approach and, um, you know, get some much needed uh, relief for veterans with Parkinson's. That's great. Well, um, you know, with all these projects that you're working on and all the great advocacy that you're doing, what would you recommend to our community, our audience today? Like what? can they do to get involved and advocate for themselves or the family can help or? A great question. And the question I always love uh, to be asked, um, you know, we need your help. We need your voice. We need to grow an army of advocates around the country. If we're going to have impact, people ask me, you know, how did Alzheimer's get so successful? 
Well, they got successful by building an army of advocates. Um, and by that, um, well, one, one step that everybody could take is go to our website, um, michaeljfox.org backslash advocacy, where you can sign up to, to be an advocate and get more information. Um, but anytime you can interact with an elected official or a policymaker, and by policymaker, it could be a staff person, tell them about your Parkinson's or your, your loved one's Parkinson's. Uh, tell them the story. Uh, storytelling is, is proven to be one of the most effective ways to get elected officials to pay attention. And you know, while I've talked about a lot of our priorities and you can talk about those, you don't have to be a professional lobbyist, um, just telling that story. Uh, because one of the th lessons from Alzheimer's is, you know, all those families didn't all have a, you know, a, a piece of paper saying, I want you to do X, Y, and Z. They just told their story and told these people what the impact was um, on their lives, on their loved ones' lives. The, the, you got to pull at the heartstrings and get people um, to pay attention. And the more people that are doing that, the more top of mind Parkinson's is going to be on, yeah. on the policymaker mind. The other thing you're going to find is you're going to find a lot of connections to people with Parkinson's through those lawmakers, um, which is really important for us to know about, because if, if we know a lawmaker is connected to Parkinson's, we believe they're going to be much more likely to want to help us. Um, and so, you know, attend town meetings. If you're involved in politics, go to candidate forums, ask questions about Parkinson's, um, you know, because this is an easy one. doesn't matter if you're conservative or liberal, Democrat or Republican. If you ask a question about, you know, Parkinson's, you know, has done this to my life. Will you support more research funding for Parkinson's? Will you do more for Parkinson's people? Every candidate's going to, they're all going to give the same answer. It's going to be absolutely, I'm mm -hmm. with you. Yeah. Um, but that's the first step to get them on the record saying that because then once they get elected then you go back in and say at that candidate forum you said you'd help and i'm here to ask for your help um so that's you know those are some pretty simple ways to get involved yeah from the, from the advocacy standpoint um but another way to get involved if, if we want to help um, find new treatments and ultimately a cure for parkinson's um research is critical um you know, whether it's through the Fox Foundation, we have uh, Fox Trial Finder, which is like a match.com where you can go in and find um, clinical trials that you could possibly participate in. Um, our biggest research initiative right now is, is PPMI, the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative. And we are um, heavily recruiting uh, new people into that initiative. So uh, that is a great way to get involved and it's very easy. Uh, and even if you don't have Parkinson's, like I don't have Parkinson's, but I'm part of PPMI. Uh, it's a very simple way to get involved, but it's critically important information for the researchers. Um, and, and PPMI has been around for a number of years, um, but we launched version 2.0 uh, in recent months. And we're just doubling down, trying to get as many people involved as possible because we think that that is, that is the tool that is going to give us answers. Um, and so uh, getting involved in the research aspects is really important as well. So just so um, the audience know, understands what you're talking about, um, I think, so the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative, I don't know if you wanna just say a few words like what, what that is and why that's so important to find these markers um, for. Yeah. I mean, we're trying to grow a, a much bigger um, universe of people in PPMI. And our ultimate goal is to see if we can identify um, attributes of people with Parkinson's, but do so at an earlier and earlier stage and then drive industry and research toward creating therapies at an earlier and earlier stage so that we could essentially arrest the disease or, yeah. or dramatically slow the disease. Um, so that's one component of it. Um, it's, um, it's in, in some respects, it's an effort to come up with a strategy to prevent Parkinson's. Um, you know, we know how we can prevent it in certain respects if we eliminate these dangerous toxins so that people's Parkinson's never gets triggered. That's one way to prevent Parkinson's, but obviously that's not a hundred percent way to do it. And so PPMI is really driven toward the ultimate goal of preventing Parkinson's. Yeah, I guess preventing and monitoring and 
all of that. Yeah. So is that uh, people will, if they sign up, they get blood work and... Uh, uh, the earlier version of PPMI gave people the opportunity to give samples, blood work, spinal taps, um, which I've heard not is not recommended. Um, but the, the one I'm talking about is purely online. Um, okay. There is no requirement to give uh, specimens and things like that. Um, but uh, it, which again, makes it easier for more people. Um, uh, I signed up a few months ago. I think I've done two, two of the surveys so far. Um, I will say that if you don't have Parkinson's, you get through the surveys quicker because you don't have symptoms to report on. Um, yeah. But but it really does collect data from a broad population of people that, that is really helping the researchers. And this data, uh, we have an open data policy at the foundation. Um, and part of that, the PPMI data is open data and it's it's been downloaded worldwide, um, I think like 6 million times already. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is like the database of record for Parkinson's researchers, not just here, but throughout the world. Yeah, that's remarkable. Yeah, and I, I was floored when I heard that. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> and I'm glad to know that so many people are interested in doing research. <laughs> right, right. So hopefully that's going to trigger some progress, more progress than we already have made. So, well, I know that study, I've been involved in that too, signed up for that. And I think, you know, I would just encourage everybody to sign up for that study. And we're going to put that link also um, in the chat and we're going to put it um, right under this video uh, afterwards. So people will be able to access it. Um, so let's see, do we have any other questions? So is there anything else, Ted, that you think we should share any other highlights yeah. that you might have missed. But. Yes, um, I, I've touched on it a bit, but I, 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 I want to focus on a little bit more, and, and that is the environmental aspects. Um, a lot of people with Parkinson's have no idea that it might have been triggered by exposure to a chemical or a compound or heavy metals, and that has, over the last several years, become a bigger and bigger focus for the foundation. Yeah. And um, I mentioned Paraquat, which is widely used in the United States. It's banned in roughly 25% of the nations on earth, but we still use it. And our federal EPA last summer um, reauthorized the use of Paraquat for another 15 years. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've got legislation to ban Paraquat. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of uh, litigation suing manufacturers of Paraquat. We're not involved in that. But we felt the appropriate role for us based on that EPA decision was to sue the federal government. So we, along with um, some farm worker groups and environmental groups um, are suing the EPA over their decision to keep this extraordinarily dangerous and deadly toxin on the market. So that's, that's one piece. Um, but we're looking at other triggers as well. Trichloroethylene is another known trigger of Parkinson's. It's been banned in Minnesota and New York but we are, going, we are beginning to do more, more work around that from a policy perspective. Uh, we've engaged the World Health Organization generally about Parkinson's, but after we had a meeting about a year ago this month, they asked for a follow-up that I put together to focus on the environmental aspects. And so we um, uh, are working internationally from that standpoint. Um, culminating all of this is, well, not culminating, one other piece of this is last year during the, the budget um, uh, efforts, we got what's called report language included. Um, it's language that accompanies the spending bill telling agencies what they should do. And um, we have language in there directing the National Institute on Environmental Health Sciences to focus on the environmental aspects of Parkinson's. And then we, we rattle them off, you know, herbicides, pesticides, um, heavy metals, first responders. Um, there is some evidence of a much higher prevalence of Parkinson's among firefighters. Mm. And if you think about it for a second, it makes sense. They run into 150 year old burning buildings with all of these chemicals and stuff that you and I don't get exposed to. So we're really trying to take a very comprehensive approach on, on all of these things. Um, and so, and we, and related to that report language, um, we are now working on convening a, um, a scientific meeting, hopefully uh, early fall, 
to pull together the various federal agencies that um, work on the environmental aspects, uh, along with us and, and others in the research community. Um, because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, I do have a law degree, but, you know, just common sense tells me, listen, there is some low hanging fruit out there. Yeah. Why aren't we looking at the low hanging fruit? And that fruit is all the chemicals that we allow into our environment. And especially when you've got, you know, Paraquat, as an example, you know, over 50 countries have already banned it. And there, right. are, there are dozens of chemicals that have been banned in the EU that we still use widely here. And um, then we're supporting the, the bill that we're supporting to ban par Paraquat. That's just actually one small piece of that bill. Um, it's a broader package to dramatically reform the pesticide approval process in the U.S. and to immediately re-review all those chemicals that are banned in the EU um, to have the EPA re-review those because Americans are being exposed to things that Europeans aren't. And um, and I don't think most, bear, most Americans don't know that human health is not the highest priority when it comes to pesticide approvals in this country, the way it is in other countries. So I just wanted to highlight that because we are doing a significant amount of work, both policy and research around the environmental triggers of Parkinson's. Um, and again, a lot of people, they're just, they're floored when they find out that, oh, my summer job back in college when I was cleaning out, you know, uh, drums of chemicals, uh, that's what caused my Parkinson's or my parents were at Camp Lejeune, um, you know, for a period of time. And I was a little boy and that's how I got my Parkinson's because the water was contaminated. Um, and so there, again, there's so, so much just right in front of us. And, mm -hmm. and I've started to make this pitch a little bit. One of the agencies we haven't talked about that got created uh, as part of the budget this year is ARPA-H, the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health. Um, and we did have a conversation with them. They wanted to talk about you know, our ideas for standing up this new agency. And I just couldn't resist making the pitch I just made. And I said, you should focus on this stuff that's right in front of our faces. Um, you can tell I'm a little passionate about it. Yeah. Um, but uh, well, it's, it's, really, great, yeah. Great, it's great to have a foundation, you know, the, the broad support for it. And I recently brought on uh, the, our policy lead for these issues is actually an environmental scientist herself. So it's great to have somebody who is a PhD who gets this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've got a good team. Well, that's um, so important and it's so frustrating that, that those chemicals can just be out there and we have, I mean, you can try to eat as healthy as you possibly can, but you still can't avoid right. all the pesticides and the impact of the pesticides on our whole food chain. And yeah, and I, I will note because I'm not oblivious to the fact that banning some of these things are going to have an economic impact. And so you know, we're looking for opportunities to have a carrot and a stick um, so that, you know, efforts to get rid of things like Paraquat are coupled with, um, you know, federal or state resources to help farmers um, transition to different types of farming practices. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we, we can't ignore the fact that these chemicals are used because they're effective. And if we just remove them, that could really devastate farmers. And it could have an impact on the food supply. So we're, we're not ignoring that. And so we're trying to be creative. Uh, for example, it, the farm bill gets reauthorized every five years or so. And so that's a great opportunity we're looking at to see if we can create an incentive-based effort to get farmers to quit using Paraquat. I like that idea. Um, we got a question from Robert um, who, asked if eating organic foods can be helpful and in avoiding some um, of those Based on what I've read in part in a book by um, uh, Ray Dorsey, Michael Oaken, Todd Scher, and Boss Bloom in that book, there is conversation about eating healthy and, um, and organics, I believe, was part of it. So um, I'm not a doctor, so I can't directly answer that question, but I'll direct you to their book, uh, Ending Parkinson's Disease, because uh, I don't know if it's a whole chapter, but it is talked about, about the importance of healthy eating. Um, and then of course, you know, you all know that exercise is pretty darn important, um, you know, because that's what you do, but, but, you know, we're, 
the exercise component is, is something even the policy team is looking at um, because of the benefits of things like certain types of boxing programs that have a dramatic impact on people's gait and balance. And, um, you know, exercise can uh, eliminate falls. You know, falling is a major health. You wouldn't think so, but a few years ago, um, Medicare spent $52 billion a year treating people because they fell and hurt themselves. 52 billion, that's a oh. huge number. That year, that was higher than the entire research budget at the National Institutes of Health. And so exercise can be part of the solution, you know, and it's not a drug, it's not a device. Yeah. It's something we all, or most of us can do, and it can actually have a significant um, benefit uh, for Parkinson's patients. Yeah. Well, that we certainly know we work on that all the time and try to try to counteract those risks, but it is a big one for, for people with Parkinson's and, and other older adults. So yeah. um, that I'm all for that <laughs> for sure. <laughs> as we, we work on a lot of balance issues. Yeah. Um, well, I'm really glad you brought up the environmental issues because I know that's really huge and been um, such a one of the main things that we we know does cause Parkinson's. So, um, well, and from a uh, now one of the limits I will say one of the limits of like some of these data collections efforts is you know they're they can, they're a moment in time. So you may live in Austin right now, but if you grew up in rural Texas you know, in a farming community exposed to a bunch of pesticides, that data may not be captured in electronic data system. But that's yeah. an example of why the research that could come out of it, because if, if a researcher can contact you and find out your, more about your life history, that's where they could start to identify clusters. Or if you lived in the industrial, you know, part of a, of a city, and there are a lot like Former Congressman Jack Quinn, a Republican congressman from upstate New York, um, he and two of his brothers have Parkinson's, and he's now on our board. He's been active working with my team on policy issues, but but he once relayed to me, he said, you know, you know, in my head, I walk up and down the street that I grew up on, and it's uncanny how many people have Parkinson's. Mm. So that's an example of a, po a possible cluster. And so yeah. we need to do more research and find those people. And because there could be a lot of answers just sitting out there that, that we yeah. haven't found yet. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that would be, I'm sure there is. It just takes the time and effort to try to figure that all out. It's, right. it's difficult. Um, let's see. We have another question uh, from Craig. Wanted to know if you're aware of Medicare considering supporting exercise programs that fall outside of physical therapy. Um, um, good question. And uh, currently they don't, but it is actually um, an issue that has that we've been talking about and working on. Um, you know, boxing specifically, we're trying to get. We we did have a researcher. Um, analyzed data that showed a benefit. It was retrospective, you know, it was a look back. Um, and we're actually looking at ways in which we could possibly get more exercise research done. Because um, if we know it's a benefit, and for example, if, if because you're doing boxing or you're doing some other sort of exercise, if it prevents you from falling, ending up in the emergency room and getting admitted to the hospital, um, you know, that episode is probably going to be $60,000. But if by reimbursing somebody for an exercise therapy outside of physical therapy, but if that results in not having that episode that costs 60 or 70 grand, but the health insurance plan had to pay out $10,000 that year for you to have that benefit, they netted a savings of 50 or 60,000. Yeah. And so while, you know, it's a quality of life issue that's most important the health economics is what will drive policies, I think, that will um, get insurers to start reimbursing uh, for some of these things. And I'll mention Jack again, Jack Quinn, through his own advocacy, has gotten several of the health plans in the Buffalo, New York area to actually pay either all or part of the boxing lessons. So, um, 
Yeah, so we're intrigued by it and we're looking into it. Um, uh, there's not an immediate answer, but in, in order to get a benefit added to Medicare, for example, you know, we need data, we need science to back it up. They're not gonna just do it. Um, and the likelihood is that there's gonna have to be a specific type of regimen um, for it to get reimbursed so that not every corner gym or of any type can just automatically get um, payments for this, but it, it would have to be, a, a in this case, a very Parkinson specific uh, exercise regimen. But, um, but it, it, it makes sense. I mean, if we cover physical therapy, you know, that's for a specific reason, um, but boxing and, and uh, some of these other forms of exercise, in many respects, is just a different type of physical therapy, um, but it's a longer term um, maintenance type therapy. Well, we, just as a reminder, Power for Parkinson's is free and we uh, do all kinds of um, exercise and have seen dramatic results from our classes where people, um, you know, might come in with a walker or a wheelchair. We've seen them get out of them, you know, and not have to use them anymore. Um, so I think that you know, boxing is one modality. There's lots of different modalities that can improve people's quality of life. And uh, well, I know Craig who asked the question. He, he is one of our participants. So he comes to, to our classes um, regularly, um, but not everyone has, a, has our free class. I mean, but our, our classes are available on YouTube right. for free, um, fortunately. So there's something out there. Yep. No, absolutely. You're right. And, and it's uneven access. And, and, you know, one of the silver linings of the pandemic, I guess, has been to enable organizations like yours to become even more national um, and, and not geographically restricted. Um, I know PMD Alliance and many others are saying the same thing. They're just reaching a much broader audience. Um, and I know time's up, but I'm just going to end my comments by just, again, going back to the UPAC a little bit. You know, because I'm sure it's no secret. You've heard it. I've heard it. Everybody in the audience has probably said it that there are too many organiz too many Parkinson's organizations. Um, well, UPAC is one attempt to unify the organizations to speak with one voice, um, to coordinate where we can to not replicate. I mean, we do try at the Fox Foundation to not replicate what other, what other organizations are doing. Um, what you're doing, what APDA Parkinson's Foundation. There are things that, that all the organizations do that we don't do, and we value those partnerships because they're really important to us. And, um, and so I just, I, I just wanted to put that out there because, um, you know, supporting your local Parkinson's organization, your local effort, your support group, you know, that's really important. And it's a great way to connect to, um, you know, to, to, to your, you know, fellow Parkinson's folks and caregivers. Um, I forgot to mention one relatively new opportunity we have as well. It's called the Buddy Parkinson's Buddy Network. And it's um, our effort to create an online community for folks to connect. Um, it's rel relatively new. It hasn't been promoted too heavily yet, but um, I'll just mention that because it could be another way for folks to get connected. That's great. I did see that on your website. So, yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. And there's a lot of great information and I hope that uh, people will, you know, if something speaks to you that you'll get involved. It's uh, the one thing you can really do to, to help change the trajectory of the disease process of research and uh, hopefully find a cure one day. So. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. And thanks to everybody who, uh, who tuned in and who will watch it on YouTube. Appreciate the opportunity.